welcome to the Father of Ishtach. Good evening, and Shemanar Nishach Tanisha. This week, uh, we welcome Dr. Mary Phelan, an esteemed colleague from the School of Applied Language and Translation Studies, or SALIS, uh, which has a tradition, of course, of cooperation with our own school here, uh, both before and since incorporation. Uh, Dr. Phelan is the director of the Center for Translation and Textual Studies in DCU. She is also the chairperson of the Irish Translators and Interpreters Association. Uh, Mary's research focuses on interpreting, and she published last year a book with Four Courts Press, uh, Irish Speakers, Interpreters and the Courts, 1754 to 1921. She also co-authored a book on ethics in public service and interpreting this year, and thus we can see that Dr. Phelan's research interests and expertise on interpreting span from the 1700s to the present day. Her PhD thesis, if she doesn't mind me saying, is also on Doris, um, for those who wish to check that out, and it's an excellent read. Um, Dr. Phelan's research, therefore, has a broad uh, interdisciplinary appeal for interpreting scholars, uh, for historians, and of course, for Irish language scholars. And as uh, Dr. Fionn gave a lecture last year at the School of History and Geography, so I just have to allow somebody in here uh, to the School of History and Geography, it is only fitting uh, that we have the opportunity um, to uh, welcome her into Fionter Agascon Nguelge, Marcinta Fadro Dishtach, Mary, and thanks very much um, uh, for taking this opportunity to share your research with us. Now, the title of uh, Mary's talk today is Irish Language Court Interpreter Provision in the 19th Century, Who Were the Interpreters? So, Mary, thanks very much again. Um, thanks very much, Porik. Um, thanks, every, thanks very much, everybody, for being here today. And apologies, my spoken Irish isn't up to giving this in Irish. Um, I can read and listen to Irish fine, but... Um, it wouldn't be good for you to listen to my Irish at all. It would probably destroy all your Irish, so we can't go down that road. So I'm going to talk today about um, uh, my research on Irish language court interpreting. So as Porik mentioned, um, it starts in 1754, and I'll explain why, and I continued it up to um, the, just before the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922. So I, I think the topic of you know who who were the interpreters is kind of is an interesting one you know because they were in a tricky position they were administering British justice and facilitating it in a sense so who were those people so today I'm going to start by um, talking a little bit about the background so how was the system organised how were interpreters appointed and then I'm going to give you some examples of interpreters and kind of background information about them to try and work out a little bit about who they were. So the background, um, right, the, the key piece of legislation really is the Administration Justice Language Act 1737, because this um, provided that the courts had to work through English and it says no longer through French and Latin. And that was not a problem in the courts because many lawyers and judges were using you know, French and Latin and you know, mixing it up with the English. But of course, there were many Irish speakers in the country at that time, and there's no mention of the Irish language in the Act at all. There was a similar Act uh, passed in England and Wales uh, previous to 1737, so it's kind of the, the spread of the English language is what we're talking about. However, this must have created huge problems for the courts at the time, because they, they obviously needed to communicate with Irish speakers if they had an Irish speaking witness in the case, they needed to know what they were saying. Um, it wasn't in their interest really to pass justice on a defendant who didn't speak English and who couldn't understand what they were saying. So we can only assume that at this early stage, they had all kinds of ad hoc solutions, whoever they could find. Then Donegal, um, interestingly, uh, took an initiative. Their grand jury introduced a salary for an interpreter in 1754. Now the grand juries were the precursors to the county councils. Um, so they, there was a grand jury in each county and there were also grand juries in towns and cities. 
So they came up with their own scheme, their own kind of local scheme. So you can just about see, just about to see um, two pounds. We present two pounds to be levied and paid to and pay the treasurer and by him to be and by him to uh, own McConaughey for his year's wages as interpreter. So this is the first salary being paid to an interpreter and it's 1754 in Donegal. So they've solved their, their local problem. The money to pay all the grand jury accounts was collected locally. So any grand jury that decided to pay an interpreter, um, that, that money was coming basically from a rate system and that money was collected locally. And the amount could be reduced. Um, well, sorry, I, I better go on to the laws first before I talk about that. So Johnny Gall has taken the initiative here. They're, they're finding a solution to a local problem. And it takes you know, almost 20 years before an actual law comes in. So in 1773, 1774, um, the grand jury um, are allowed by law to pay interpreters at a size five pounds per half year. So they can, they're, they're paid 10 pounds a year basically. But that only solves the problem at, at one level, at the assize courts, which were the highest courts. So there are lots of other courts in action at this stage and they don't have a solution. In the 19, sorry, in the 1820s, they start to introduce petty sessions courts around the country, but there's never any provision for salaried interpreters there. Uh, later, there are some payments from Dublin Castle, but um, there were all kind of one-off instances. And obviously the petty sessions were the lowest courts, so there must have been huge demand for interpreters there. And they came up with all kinds of different solutions. So I don't have time to talk about those solutions today. I'm going to concentrate on the salaried interpreters. Now there is evidence of uh, letters to Dublin Castle um, recommending that interpreters be provided in the court of sessions courts. And eventually the, they give in and they do provide this. Now, I, I reckon this is only provided because under the Irish Parliament, you know, you have this provision already for the assize interpreters. I spent a lot of time uh, wondering why do the British, you know, provide interpreters at all? But they really, it wasn't really an official thing from Dublin Castle ever. It was really a local solution to a local problem. So in 1837, you've got grand juries allowed to pay 15 pounds per half year or 30 pounds a year to inter interpret the quarter sessions. So that's helping solve problems. And I think it's interesting that this is 1837 and this law is coming in. So because the grand juries were keeping accounts all the time, you know, which the, they call presentments and there's all different names for them. Sometimes they're queries, sometimes they're presentments. Uh, so it, it complicates things when you're looking for things on catalogues. Um, but they have these uh, that are published twice yearly. They're printed twice yearly. And in some cases, a, a few hundred copies were made. So that improves the chances of them surviving. So this is an example from Cork uh, towards the end of the 19th century. And if you go inside, you find uh, records of an interpreter. This, the next slide is an example from Tipperary. So this is Tipperary South Riding in 1839. And you can see number three here is a payment to Thomas Heffernan, the interpreter at the Assize Court. He's been paid three pounds. And there's also a payment to an unnamed quarter sessions interpreter. He's been paid six pounds. So, yeah, so this is really fantastic for you know, finding out who the interpreters were when they're named, which is fantastic. They're not always named. And also to get an idea how long they worked in the system. And many worked in the system for decades, some of them literally until they dropped dead, basically. So um, it clearly was seen as, as, a, as an important job, a, a good job to have, I would suggest. And of course, if you think of the work, the size interpreters being paid a maximum of ten pounds a year, but they wouldn't have been working every week. You know, they might have done a work uh, done a week in in the spring and a week in the summer. It would depend on how busy the court was, but it certainly wasn't a question of interpreting every day. Um, and the court sessions they met more regularly, four times a year. But again, it's not a full time, uh, you know, eight hour day or whatever, or, or you know, 
it, it's it's only as the as the as the courts sit. So what did interpreter provision look like in 1807? Right. So all the counties in grey, uh, all the all, all the grand, grand juries in those counties were paying salary were paying a salary to interpreters. So if you go back to um, around 1801, an interpreter was being paid in in London in Derry. There's no record ever of interpreters in, in, in being paid in Antrim and Down. In 1845, a law was passed allowing for an interpreter in Dublin, but that was never taken up. And that's what caused the problems in the Mam Trastner trials in 1882. There was no interpreter in Dublin. In, Kild in Kildare and Wicklow, there are records, occasional records of interpreters, um, but nothing kind of consistent. And the records haven't survived at all for uh, Leach and Offaly. Um, my gut feeling is that there may well have been interpreters in those four counties, um, you know, in the into the late uh, 18th century, but obviously that's speculative, I can't prove it. But there were interpreters in all those counties in grey, which uh, I think is, uh, in a way, it's pretty amazing. And then if we move on to 1841 to 1843, so this is before the famine, there are interpreters in all these grey counties. So we can see that English is, you know, it's on the move. Irish is kind of retreating. Um, but you still have quite a lot of uh, salaried interpreters being employed. Um, so in Ulster, the number of counties has reduced. Armagh is gone, Fermanagh is gone. In Leinster, the only county is Kilkenny, and that's probably mainly in South Kilkenny, where the, the, the need for interpreters and interpreters is probably greater. And you've got all of Munster and Connacht uh, with interpreters. And in some counties, you've got um, you've got a couple of interpreters, more than one interpreter, because at this stage there's interpreters at a size and at quarter sessions. And by the end of the century, again, you can see um, Irish is in retreat, but you still have interpreters in Donegal. Uh, Sligo, I have to confess, I was slightly surprised at that one. Uh, Mayo, Galway, Clare, Kerry, Cork, Waterford. Now, Tipperary, that is kind of surprising, but in fact, that interpreter was being paid really as an act of charity by the grand jury because he's quite elderly. Yeah, so that's the reason why Tipperary is still there. But it's still, well, it's still, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's I think, um, I think, um, most research in the past have kind of assumed, you know, based on when you read so much about um, the decline of the Irish language, the death of the Irish language, and we forget that there were still a lot of um, Irish speakers around the place who needed interpreters. And I should also say that the interpreters were really only for people who didn't speak English. There was a lot of suspicion that people were pretending that they needed an interpreter, that they did in fact understand what was being said, that they were just looking for extra time to think over their answers. But at the same time, you still have this ongoing provision. And uh, I suppose the other thing I should mention that is that the amount of the amount of the salary that uh, interpreters were paid that could be reduced by the grand juries. So in many counties, that went down as the amount of work uh, decreased over time. So how were interpreters appointed? So at the assize level, they were interpreted, they were appointed by the grand jury. And some on a few occasions, the appointments and you know, for and against certain people being appointed, uh, all of that was discussed in court. And in some cases, the interpreters had the support of a barrister or a solicitor to make their case. But it's really a question of, of patronage. Patronage. It's um, it's all about letters of recommendation, because there's a, a file, a surviving file from 1893 in the National Archives, and um, you've got all these people applying for the job in Mayo, and they're all sending in letters of recommendation from various people. So it could be the parish priest, it could be whoever. Um, but the person who gets the job is the person who has the support of the high sheriff and he's very well positioned on the grand jury to push that appointment through. You know, he's, he doesn't have any experience as an interpreter. Other people do. Um, he seems to be a good Irish speaker. 
but yeah, the the, re, the real reason that's um, giving him the job is because he has support from um, important people, basically. There, um, there are um, a couple of mentions of a test at one stage in Sligo that seems to have been set up by some local people, but there was there was never any national level testing system, you know, to ensure that people had good language skills and could actually interpret. But of course, uh, we don't have that nowadays for any interpreters in the courts, so it's no surprise it didn't really it didn't exist back then. So at quarter sessions, so I mentioned that in 1837, a law was brought in uh, providing a salary of 30 pounds a year for quarter sessions. And for some unknown reason, it was decided um, in that law that the appointment would, would be in the hands of the chairman or the county judge. Um, so um, in some cases that may have been fine, um, but there were instances of bribery in Kerry where the county judge uh, accepted bribes uh, from would-be interpreters, substantial bribe, bribes, more than £30. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a, a bit dodgy. And I think the easy solution for a lot of chairmen of the quarter sessions was to give the job to a process server. Now, a process server um, is similar to a summons server. You know, basically, they're bringing bad news. You don't particularly want a summons server knocking on your door with a summons telling you you're going to have to come to court or bringing other equally bad news. But I think if there were, if there were a, a, a process server attached to the quarter sessions who had good Irish, the, the easy option was just to make them uh, interpreters as well. And that was also problematic because process servers had to go off around the place you know, delivering their, their processes and they weren't always available in court to act as interpreters. And process servers were also universally hated as were summon servers and civil bill officers and they're actually, actually the largest group of interpreters. So most interpreters were process servers, summon servers or civil bill officers. And there are lots of reports in the newspapers of attacks on process servers, summon servers and civil bill officers. Um, some people, some of them were killed, some were injured, some were chucked into rivers, some were made to eat their summonses. You know, there is a lot of um, dislike, if not hatred of some of, of this particular group. And there are a few mentions in the in the folklore archives um, of, you know, of this basically, that they were generally hate, hated. Yeah, surprisingly, um, the, folk, the folklore records don't really cover interpreters. This, you know, one or two scanty mentions of them. Yeah, I was expecting a tre treasure trove of information about interpreters there. There would be a, a chapter in my book, but that didn't happen at all. Possibly because nobody asked any questions about the interpreters. That's the only explanation I can think of. It, you know, it, it, I, I really don't understand, you know, why why there aren't aren't stories about um, about interpreters. So getting on to my point two with the interpreters, they're really quite a mixed bunch. So you've got all sorts of people as interpreters. So. Um, Simon Conway, I think he's a really interesting person. Um, so he's quite early. Um, he was born in 1792. He was appointed um, interpreter at quite a young age. And he's down in Mayo. And in 1822, he writes a letter to the Lord Lieutenant. And he's complaining because he he's on a salary at 60 pounds a year, which he shouldn't be at all, because this is 1822, he should, he should just be earning a, ten, a tenner a year. Um, but he's actually been paid 60 pounds by the, by the Mayo Grand Jury. And they're under pressure to stick to the law and to just pay him 10 pounds, because um, at this stage, you know, the, I suppose the authorities are saying, you know, why are grand juries paying more money to interpreters and they're supposed to be paid by law. What is going on here? This shouldn't be happening. So he writes a, a very interesting letter to the Lord Lieutenant and he suggests that he thinks 70 pounds would be a more appropriate salary because he's interpreting at quarter sessions. He's interpreting at the Court of Insolvent Debtors. He should be paid for that. And even more interesting, he encloses um, certificates from lots of important people including members of parliament, members of the grand jury, the high sheriff, the clerk of the peace, 
Assistant Bar Barrister for Mayo, who'd be the important person in the Quarter Sessions Court. Three respectable attorneys. I don't think all attorneys were respectable at the time. And the Chief Justice of the King's Bench. And now, unfortunately, those certificates haven't survived. So we just have the record, you know, from his letter that he has enclosed them. But there's also an interesting note on the back of his letter. It says that uh, Simon Conway is a very deserving public officer, which is quite surprising because um, this is about an Irish language court interpreter. So I was very surprised to see that note, uh, particularly from Dublin Castle. Um, that would be uh, an exceptional um, addendum. So a bit more information on Simon Conway. Now he did have lots of jobs uh, connected with the courts. Um, uh, some really kind of uh, uh, things that are don't, don't, exist, don't exist anymore. But he was also a land agent. And in that role, he would have been expected to draw up agreements with tenants, collect rent, supervise or superintend improvements to the land. And land agents were paid a commission now, obviously, if he's collecting rents and so on, and, um, you know, that could, I'm sure that was quite tricky at times in Mayo. Uh, drawing up agreements with tenants, obviously, his language skills in Irish would have been really useful there. Um, and a lot of these interpreters, they're really building on their bilingual skills. They're using their knowledge of Irish to their advantage. Um, you know, it, it, they're really playing quite an interesting role. And from at least 1835, Simon is a petty sessions clerk. And over a three year period, he was paid 131 pounds in fees. So he's doing pretty well. And I mean, this isn't too long after the penal laws and all the restrictions on Catholics and so on. And I think it's really interesting when we see how well some people managed to do, you know, um, a few decades after the end of the penal laws, of the, of the penal laws. Um, Thomas J. Reed, so he's in Galway and he's really quite similar to Simon Conway. So, you know, Simon Conway isn't a, a total one-off. So Thomas J. Reed is an interpreter at Galway Crown Record and Insolvent Courts. He's a clerk at Galway Petty Sessions on a very good salary. Um, I think this is because it's slightly later in time than, um, than Simon Conway. He's been pay being paid 300 pounds a year. He's the chairperson of the Petty Sessions clerks of, of Ireland. So they've got an association. He's a baronial collector. So he's collecting the cess uh, from 1844 to 1848. And he's been paid for that. He's a clerk to the conservators of salmon and inland fisheries. He's an inspector of fisheries, an inspector of weights and measures, an assistant clerk to the board of guardians. Yeah, it's hard to know how he juggled all these things. Um, and I suppose it's a feature of 19th century life that many people had more than one job. Um, but yeah, he really had a, a, a lot going on. So he obviously has a lot of um, clout um, to get these jobs and he's probably a very smart guy as well that you know is able to fulfill all those functions and do a good job and um, and you know take on more work. Um, this is what a different example. Um, this is James Beatty. So he was a Crown Court interpreter in Sligo from 1814 to 26. And uh, when I was going through the presentment, the grand jury presentment records in Sligo, I nearly fell off my chair because I discovered he was uh, a jailer in Sligo as well. Now, that's not that's really not a good combination to be an interpreter uh, in court and working as a jailer. But in 1811, he was paid five pounds for whipping William Black. And in 1816, he was paid seven pounds for providing an executioner to execute two and whip one convicted at last to size. So I have to say, I, I don't get a great feeling about this guy. He doesn't sound very nice, does he? Um, so would you really want him interpreting at a size, you know, in a murder case or whatever, where he's supposed to be impartial, ideally? Um, yeah, I'd have to, you'd have to have your doubts about um, his abilities on that front. And next, again, this guy's different. 
And this is John Anderson. And in the presentment records, he's got the ESQ for his squire after his name. And that usually implies that people owned property or that men, or men owned property, a squire. Um, he was interpreter at County, Ken County Kilkenny Assize uh, for 22 years, 1817 to 1839. And he appears once, or he's paid once as, a, as interpreter uh, in 1824 for working at the city of Kilkenny Assize. And he's also a high constable like uh, Thomas J. Reid um, for a limited period of time. Uh, so he's collecting grand jury tax and um, the, the people who are appointed high constables, that was usually for you know, one or two or maybe three years. It wasn't a, a, a long-term job. And uh, they were generally respectable gentlemen farmers. So he's getting 63 pounds for his work as a high constable in Garwin in 1826 and 62 pounds then the following year in 1827. So again, he seems to be doing quite well, but he's not the kind of typical person you'd expect to be a court interpreter. I mean, there is no typical person really. Um, it's really about, um, I suppose when I say that, I, my preconceptions are coming into play there or my ideas, but I do think he's, he's, he's not the person that you would necessarily expect to be working as an interpreter. So again, I think that's an interesting example. Um, Michael Collins, um, so he's down in Kerry and he's working as a size interpreter from 1856. He's also a civil bill officer, which is fairly similar to being a summon server. So not a terribly popular person. Uh, and he served legal papers for many respectable firms. I mean, it doesn't matter how respectable the firms were, um, they're still bring, bring, bringing bad news to people. He was a sheriff's bailiff. Now that has to be hugely unpopular. He resigned from that position in 1867 when he was appointed a quarter sessions interpreter. So obviously he saw a conflict of, conflict of interest there, but I'm sure he was known all around Tralee as the sheriff's bailiff. However, when he died, uh, there was a short paragraph about him in, in the Kerry Weekly Reporter in 1887. And they do men mention that for a man in such a peculiarly insidious position, he always managed to retain his popularity. So I think people probably did see that, you know, the job of interpreter could be a tricky one. And if it was combined with being a civil bill officer or being a, a bailiff or a sheriff, even more insidious, potentially. Now, towards the end of the 19th century, there's a shift um, and some Irish language scholars or, and teachers, Irish language teachers start to be appointed. And this is thanks to, you know, pressure from the Gaelic League and other societies. You know, they, they start to complain about the situation regarding interpreters and to, you know, make a case for um, for good people to be appointed, I guess. I, I do think it's a pity that they don't just march into the courts and start speaking Irish, you know, or getting the lawyers to start speaking Irish, etc., and uh, start a mini revolt there. But they they just go go down go down the road of um, trying to get Irish language scholars and uh, teachers to be appointed. So Porrick Stundoon is one down in Cork and um, he's a member of the Gaelic League. He's, um, he wrote short stories. His work is published in, in various Irish, Irish language uh, uh, publications. And he also translated uh, some stuff, uh, something about um, uh, St. Finbar. And that was published in the Cork Historical and Archaeological Society. In 1893, and there's a bio of him on anim.ie. He puts his occupation down as interpreter in the 1901 census, um, and that was kind of unusual. I think it's if you look at the 1901 census, you get a, an incorrect idea of how many interpreters were out there because a lot of people didn't say that they were interpreters at the time. They put down that they were a farmer or a civil bill officer or or process server or whatever, uh, rather than saying that they were an interpreter. And that's the difficulty of when people um, have a number of jobs on the go and they may maybe pick the one that brings in the most income. 
perhaps, or the job that they see as the most important one for them. And then um, this is a Thomas Beale. Uh, I, I spent endless hours trying to track this man down. So his name in the newspapers and in the, and the presentment records is Thomas Beale, B-E-A-L-E. -E. So when I was looking at the censuses, I did find Thomas Beale's down in Dungarvan and Waterford um, who were Irish speaking. And then eventually I copped on, maybe his name was in Irish, which it was. So he's Thomas the Beale. And there's, there's a bio of him on anim.ie. It doesn't actually mention that he's an interpreter at all. I'd say um, that kind of information kind of got lost along the way. But um, he was very involved in Ring College. So he was uh, basically actually running Ring College at one stage. And he translated a considerable number of books for Ongoom, which um, I think is interesting as well. He was appointed um, interpreter in Dungarvan Again, somebody who was, he, he was appointed very young, um, I think he was only 18 or 19. And the account of that was it, of the appointment was the whole process was in the newspaper. So you have the members of the county council discussing his case and he's got letters of support from the Gaelic League, for example, from Conrad Nagelga. So this is a, a big change you know it's not just it's not um the previous people who were sending uh, letters of recommendation it's now people who are involved in the irish language movement who are who are pushing for uh, people like Thomas de Ville to be appointed as interpreter and uh, so you know, some of the letters are actually written in irish as well um and I, there's a there are some comments in Irish as well when he's appointed so there's a whole kind of different language because there's also been a move from the grand jury to the county council you've got people being elected councillors there's a whole different vibe going on it's um it's really really very very different so that's the end of the of my presentation um does anybody want to ask me any questions or comment on anything I'll get out of the stop the share. Could I actually ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks very much for that. It was very interesting. Um, I'm afraid I haven't actually, because of lockdown, I haven't actually managed to get my. I have a copy of your book, but I don't have physical access to it at the moment, uh, but I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, you mentioned that some interpreters had uh, experience of interpretation prior to their appointment as court interpreters. Could you maybe say a little bit about what that previous experience was as to where, uh, ha, what experience, what interpretation experience would be cited by an applicant to one of these posts out with the context of the courts? Yeah, so in Mayo in 1893, there were a couple of applications and uh, one of them had experience of working in petty sessions. Um, so the petty sessions, um, it's, it's, it's tricky to get a handle on what was going on, because as I mentioned, there was no law providing for salaried, salaried interpreters at petty sessions. So, um, so it's, it's hard to work out what exactly was going on. So I've used uh, newspaper accounts to try and work it out. And I've also um, done searches of the, of the, which one? the registered papers in Dublin, in, that were in Dublin Castle, that were in, that were in the National Archives. So one of the applicants in Mayo is saying that he has experience of working the petty sessions. Now, how exactly that was happening is a bit unclear. I suspect that he had experience of interpreting for people in civil cases. So people were actually paying him to go in and interpret for them. So these were Irish speakers who didn't have enough English to communicate in the petty sessions. They weren't going to be provided with an interpreter by the court. So they actually have to go and pay somebody to accompany them to do that. Other people might have relied on volunteers 
um, yeah, so I'm thinking about, I'm still thinking about those applications. Um, one guy is saying that he had some experience um, in the courts and he mentions that there were cases of murder and manslaughter and they were all successfully prosecuted. So he sounded very pleased that the people were found, found guilty, um, which is really not desirable, um, not a desirable uh, way to, to proceed. Um, so yeah, so they seem to have a mixture. Sometimes there were replacement interpreters as well. So if an interpreter couldn't uh, make it, they might have somebody lined up to replace them. So people seem to have um, built up some experience um, but they, they're not always, uh, they're not necessarily named in the grand jury books of presentments because they're not the official interpreter at the time. So, yeah, so it's a bit of a mixed bag, basically, the answer to your question. Yeah, thanks very much. I suppose one of the, the reasons that I'm asking is that in, in, a, in a place like, well, in, in most of the places that you've discussed, but thinking especially of Mayo in the 19th century, there's, people are going to be employed as official interpreters but in an area where you have such rapid language shift from within the within the span of a century from you know, almost uniform uh, Irish monolingualism at the start of the century to almost uniform English monolingual uh, uh, English dominant Irish bilingualism by the end of the century obviously there's a degree to which everybody is going to be an interpreter. And I'm just curious about how, you know, in, in, in daily life interpretation is, is going to be a feature of everybody's life. And I'm wondering how, whether or not that, that is reflected in any of the applications, um, any less formal context of interpretation or experience that are mentioned. Uh, no, it's not really coming through in the applications. So yeah, that's the, the only file that has survived. Um, but I would agree with you. I'm sure there was lots of interpreting happening all over the place, and it's just not recorded anywhere. Um, you know, there was interpreting at elections. Um, so um, there was interpreting for the boards of, boards of guardians. Um, I didn't put this into the book, um, but there is there are mentions of doctors and uh, you know medical interpreting, and you know there are people saying. I think it's on one of the islands, I can't remember where, maybe Cape Clear, but I could be wrong on that, saying, you know, we need an interpreter. Um, yeah, so I, I agree. I'd say there was a huge amount of informal interpreting going on by whoever was available to act as interpreter. It had to, it had to be happening on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a large scale, absolutely. Thanks very much. Thanks for a very interesting talk. I just have a quick question as well, Mary, if you don't mind. Just... Um, could you say something about the attitude of the courts towards this uh, language shift or, or even the nature of, of bilingualism or, or competency in, in English um, of people who were being tried at the time? Or was, it, was it generally taken on face value that they couldn't speak or understand English? Or um, no, that's a very broad question, I know, but... Um, just just what was the attitude and is there is there any general attitude let's say in the second half of the 19th century towards um the nature of their ability to understand English you get some judges occasionally who are very understanding and to say you know this person you know their English isn't great you know they need an interpreter we have to we have to provide an interpreter for them um you get some judges who well, I'm thinking of um, this guy, Sir Samuel O'Malley, in actually in Mayo. Mayo is a fantastic resource. The Connacht Telegraph is a wonderful newspaper. Um, their court reports are brilliant. Um, but Sir Samuel O'Malley has it in for everybody, you know, who wants to speak Irish. Uh, so he sends one guy to jail for a, a week because he refuses to speak English. Um, there are there's a lot of resistance to people saying they only speak Irish or they need an interpreter. There's, um, you've got people standing up in court saying, you know, I heard him speak English. He spoke to me in English last week. Um, I had a conversation with him in English. He, you know, he's perjuring himself. He, he does speak English, doesn't need an interpreter. Some people are convicted of perjury because they, they've, sworn that they they don't speak English and then somebody says he says they do it's you know it's actually quite extraordinary in some of the cases 
and it's um, there are some ex amazing examples from Clare as well to do with the elections. Uh, so huge resistance. They don't want these Irish speakers voting. Basically, it's really it's quite blatant in, in some of the examples. But there are some very sensible um, lawyers who kind of kind of say, okay, you said you spoke to this man in in English. So how much of the speaking was done by you and how much was done by, the, by your man? And they kind of come to the conclusion that you were doing all the talking. They were just nodding their heads or whatever and may not have actually understood what was being said to them or may not have been able to communicate in English. Um, I suppose the, the, there is an important case in 1858, Orr and Burke. Um, so in, so that was, that's Mayo again, actually, interestingly. And Mayo is a wonderful resource. Simon Conway was from Mayo as well. Um, so in Oren Burke, the, it arises from a rape trial. And at the rape trial, the, uh, an important defense witness uh, claims that he needs an interpreter. He, he's only been you know, a week or two in school, doesn't speak English. He needs an interpreter. He gets an interpreter. Um, but that case is run slightly differently from normally. Normally they check at the beginning, you know, they, they get the person to swear they don't speak English. Um, but in this case, the, I, I mean, I'm sure your man is telling lies about his evidence basically. And they're really keen to get a conviction. And, you know, even nowadays it's hard to get a rape conviction. So, so, the, so the, the prosecution has witnesses lined up who say that he spoke English and that he sang a song, Heights of Alma. And that he he he, he interacted with it with it with a maid. He spoke English to her. So there's these two witnesses. They're both women actually, and one of them is the the daughter of a school inspector or something. So to give her you know more clout. Um, so so that goes to a whole appeal through a whole appeals process. And in the appeals process, Judge Jonathan Christian seems to be very sympathetic to Irish speakers and said, you know, he says, you know, just because somebody can sing a song in, in Italian doesn't mean that they can understand Italian, speak Italian, etc. Um, so, uh, so the, the it's, yeah, so the the guy gets off basically. Um, but that case has been misunderstood. The courts were not really that in understanding. And a couple of months later, uh, Judge John Jonathan Christian, so the same guy who seems to be so nice, he's telling a, a female witness that if she doesn't speak English, she won't get her witness expenses. So witness expenses were paid to witnesses at a size, you know, to kind of compensate for them for missing work. They were really, really important to people, you know, to bring in a few quid or whatever. Um, and he's threatening this woman, um, that I think, I, I, again, I'm going from memory here, I think her, her son had been killed and she's a witness in the case. And he's telling her, if you don't speak English, you're not getting any witness expenses. And that threat did work on many people. You know, they did suddenly revert to English or some of the newspapers say they suddenly speak in capital English. And sometimes the journalists say laughter in court or whatever. So, you know, people are having, it is a bit of a joke in some cases. But he's not really sympathetic at all to the Irish speakers in reality. You know, it's all very well in theory when he's talking about, you know, Italian opera or whatever. But when it comes down to it, very unsympathetic. So, yeah, and even in the, the lock mask cases, so they were after, they were around the, around the same time. Yeah, I think they were heard after the Montrasna case. So they were heard in Dublin. But one of the defendants uh, is asked, do you speak English? I think he literally says a little, and that's fine, no interpreter. This, if they don't go any further, you know, asking, you know, trying to sort out how much English he speaks. He's understood the question, he's answered it, that's it. He's not getting an interpreter. Whereas there is one Irish speaker in that case who does get, a, who does get, get an interpreter all right. So yeah, they're very unsympathetic, I feel, to to Irish speakers. Now, I suppose um, it's coloured by what I'm reading in the newspapers, and I suppose journalists are selecting what they're going to report on the newspapers. So I suppose you have to be care you have to be careful. But I do think there's enough evidence there in the newspaper reports to show that you know they are not at all sympathetic to Irish speakers. And really, Irish speakers, the best approach, which some of them do, and probably maybe because they have no choice, 
the best the best approach is to keep on answering every everything in Irish, or, or to pretend you don't understand or whatever to get your interpreter basically. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. Test fiogal gum hena podig matan tamogin. Yeah. Right. Just uh, Mary, you, you mentioned there that. Um, these interpreters often performed other roles as well as the interpreting role that they may have been summons processors or they may have acted as bailiffs. Um, and I was interested, you mentioned at one point in your presentation that uh, there were people who seemed to have been paid for procuring practitioners of physical punishment, you know, the, 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 the guys they got to do the beatings or the whippings and even to pr procure executioners. So I was just I was just interested. Um, is there any evidence? Uh, did you come across any evidence in media reports or the newspapers or anything about these people who who did these fairly nasty uh, things, being sort of victimized by the local populace or being being uh, beaten up themselves or treated uh, badly or whatever? I didn't go down that rabbit hole. I didn't go down every other rabbit hole there was, but not that one. Um, well, I might do some Googling. It's actually a very interesting question. Um, I wonder, did they get people in from different areas or whatever? You know, like they brought in executioners over from England and they wasn't hangmen brought over from England in the not so distant past. Um, so maybe they got my my my. Uh, gut feeling is they probably got people in from outside the area but yeah I was I was actually horrified uh, when I read that one about Sligo and it wasn't coming through in other counties so I don't know what was happening up in Sligo at the time with all this uh, all these nasty practices going on but I was horrified by the jailer who was uh, doing some of it and organizing more of it so yeah pretty amazing but yeah I think that that would, that would be an interesting one to follow up yeah. okay thanks <clears throat> does anyone else have any Questions? I suppose that the notions of um, language and power comes into it as well. And, and you briefly mentioned Mom Trasna. Um, have you have you looked at that case in detail, Mary? Or yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that there was no interpreter in Dublin. Mm -hmm. So the difficulty with Mom Trasna was um, under the the Crimes Act, um, there was an awful lot of crime happening at the time. So the government was keen to secure convictions, I guess. So they decided the cases would be heard in Dublin. So the Mam Trasna court case was held in Green Street Courthouse in Dublin. And they had a problem because they didn't have an interpreter. Um, so if it had been heard in Galway, they would have had the local interpreter. And I think things would have worked out very differently. So in the Mamtrasna case, the interpreter in court is a police officer, Thomas Evans. I actually managed to um, track down some of his descendants um, and I met up with them a couple of years ago. Um, I suppose they're persona non grata out, out, in the, out in the wider Irish world these days. But anyway, I was hoping they would have a photograph of him you know, for the book, but they didn't. So what happens with Miles Joyce? So Miles Joyce had no English at all. That's totally clear um, from all the accounts. So, so the I think the judge asks, you know, does he need an interpreter? And the defending solicitor just isn't actually sure if he does or not, which makes you wonder, you know, what's been happening before this. So Thomas Evans speaks in Irish to Miles to Miles Joyce, and he seems to say, "Do you understand?" On Thigam Thu, and Miles Joyce replies, "Thigam." possibly. We don't know, we don't have the words that were spoken in Irish, but Thomas e Evans gets the message that Miles Joyce understands English, whereas Miles Joyce, uh, I mean, this is what Sean O'Curran says in his book as well, uh, Miles Joyce most likely meant that he understood what the interpreter was saying to him in Irish. So as a result, the interpreter didn't do any interpreting for the, du for the duration of the trial. And it was quite obvious to the court reporters that he didn't understand what was happening. And then, you know, the jury, you know, has six minutes to come to a decision and, you know, or rather it does that in six minutes and, you know, it's got, it comes in with the guilty verdict. And then the, they realize, oh shit, this guy doesn't understand what's been said. So, uh, so Thomas Evans starts interpreting. 
but it's important to note that they were very very different times there was no real right to an interpreter and you know if somebody had a defending solicitor they didn't necessarily have to have an interpreter interpreters didn't have to interpret everything that was said there are lots of um, instances of judges finding somebody guilty and going into a big long spiel about how bad they were etc and how what bad character they had and they, they talk for ages but that's not interpreted at all in those size cases which is really really weird so very different times um so under the law at the time it was perfectly okay for miles joyce to be in court and to be defended by henry concannon his solicitor and not to have an interpreter that wasn't totally out of line at all it was perfectly permissible by law at the time and it's only in um, I think 1911, there's a case in London about a Chinese man um, who hasn't had an interpreter and they realise, yeah, we should have interpreters or it should be clear that interpreters need to be provided. It's not enough just to have a defence solicitor. So it's only then that they start to change things. So, yeah, so the Mam Trasna case, it's really, I mean, it's, you know, in some ways, there was a pretty good interpreter provision system across the country, you know, thanks to the grand juries. It is pretty good in a lot of ways. Um, but the problems are the, the negative attitude towards Irish speakers. Um, and in the Mamtrasna case, it's really a combination of circumstances that they don't have a, they don't have a Dublin based interpreter. And obviously it's not ideal having a member of the Royal Irish Constabulary as your, as your interpreter. I mean, police officers shouldn't really be interpreters, although um, there are instances of um, constables working as interpreters in petty sessions and crown cases. Um, so, so they are doing some interpreting and I think the system probably couldn't have managed without or I see people being able to understand Irish and being able to interpret. I don't see how it could have worked otherwise. It, you know, there, have, there, there was never any requirement for or I see policemen to be to have a knowledge of Irish, but I think for the system to function, it functioned better if, if some of them did have is in Irish speaking areas. Yes, yeah, so Mam Trasna is a total aberration. It's, uh, it's not at all typical of what was happening in the courts. Okay. Thanks Mary. I think we'll have to, um, we'll have to bring this to a close. Uh, I know some people are um, attending meetings or have lectures at two. Um, but uh, thanks uh, very much, Mary Gramil Mahagut. And um, yeah, I see a few Bula Bus there appearing on screen. Um, most interesting. Um, I might have a quick word with you, Mary, just before um, just before you go. But uh, thanks everyone for attending. Mm -hmm.